Okay, I guess we're going to get started now. Welcome, everybody. My name is Joan Brzezinski, and I direct the China Center at the University of Minnesota. Welcome to today's webinar, The Unbearable Weight of Being Chinese, with our guest speaker, Dr. Yang Yang Chung. I thank you for joining today and for your support of the China Center in this webinar series. Your generosity makes programs like this possible. I offer a special thanks to Joseph and Kaime Terry for their generous support of this program. We invite you to help our, us advance our mission and to give the China Center through the link at the webinar announcement or on our website. At the end of the program, we will have answer questions that you submit through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. But if you have technical difficulty, you can um, use the chat and someone will respond. This time, I welcome Associate Vice President and Dean for International Programs at the University of Minnesota, Meredith McQuaid, to give some opening remarks. Welcome, Meredith. Thanks, John. Welcome, everybody. It's so nice to see so many people here. A uh, special welcome to Dr. Chung, whom uh, Joan Brzezinski will introduce momentarily. I just want to mention that this series, the Considering China webinar series, um, has been just a fabulous way to learn more about China and the U.S. relationship with China. But we've tried to do it through a lens of just the, the multi-dimensional aspect of uh, China history. We've covered music, culture, art. Uh, there have been <clears throat> webinars on science, law, medicine. It's been sort of pandas to pandemic. Uh, and since the first one, which was in March of 2020, um, or thereabouts right after lockdown, uh, Haiyan and Joan did a fabulous job of trying to keep the conversation going between our two countries and about our two countries. Um, I think most of us will remember that there was some um, confusion about the source of the pandemic and the China Center really wanted to uh, just create understanding and provide more information in a really fun and engaging way. And um, we've had just fabulous speakers. Uh, Dr. Chung has written particularly about the need for us to understand um, China and Chinese people as individuals. And I think that's really what this webinar series has tried to do is, um, just help us all learn more about the amazing aspects of uh, the China of China and the Chinese, and really truly about our relationship. Um, because as you know, the University of Minnesota has had ties to China for well over a hundred years, and um, we didn't want the pandemic to get in the way of that. So uh, I want to thank Joan and Haiyan for all of their efforts, and all of you. Many of you have come every time to our webinars. And so you've seen the breadth and um, others of you may be here for the first time. And I wouldn't blame you because today's speaker is gonna be outstanding. I told her this morning before um, the webinar started that I started digging into some of her writing in this morning and I just lost myself. There's so much good uh, information out there and she's extremely talented. So I'll turn it back to Joan and she'll give you a more full introduction of our speaker today. Uh, but thanks again for being here and thanks for um, wanting to learn more about China. Thank you, Meredith. Um, it is my great privilege to introduce our speaker, Dr. Yang Yang Chung. Dr. Chung is a, currently a fellow and research scholar at Yale School Paul's High Center, China Center, where her work focuses on the development of science and technology and in China-US relations. I personally enjoyed reading her many essays, exploring topics from academic freedom to the boundaries of scientific inquiry and implications for research and national security to her passionate reflections on the experience of being foreign and Asian in the United States. Her essays have appeared in the New York Times, The Guardian, The Atlantic, Wired, Los Angeles Review of Books, and many other publications. She's a columnist with SubChina, which is an online news and business service platform. She's also contributing columnist to Physics World, born and raised in China. Dr. Chung received her PhD in physics from the University of Chicago, and her current um, Position oh, before her current position, she was um, at the Large Hadron Collider LHS for over a decade, and most recently at Cornell University as a LH LHC Physics Center Distinguished Researcher at Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. Welcome, Dr. Chung. Thank you so much, Joan, for the overly <laughs> generous introduction, and thank you so much to uh, Dean Quad for for the very kind introduction as well. And so I have some slides, I'll share my screen here. And 
So um, here I, um, I put the title as the unbearable weight of being Chinese. And uh, can you see the slides? Um, so here there is a map. And, and I really like this map that I found in, at Yale Library, where it says like China according to the newest and most exact observations. And this map was published in London in the early 18th century. And uh, this was part of a series of maps uh, made in the Great Britain about uh, Asia, Africa, and the Americas. And of course, when the time uh, when this map was being made, China was ruled by the Manchu Qing Empire. And in particular, this was during the reign of Kangxi Emperor, who was the longest serving emperor in China. And during his reign, the empire greatly expanded its geographical boundaries to a large extent through military conquest and colonial settlements. And the legacy of the Qing Empire still remains to this day, where we see how the maps of China today are being drawn and how the boundaries are defined. And so for this talk, um, I'll be talking about these shifting borders and shifting identities, how China is perceived by forces, both foreign and domestic, and how Chinese people are perceived and perceive themselves. And I should say ourselves. And so this is not an academic lecture. I'm not going to go so much into really obscure concepts or theory. Uh, this is, I would like this to be a rather relaxed format while we'll share some stories and have a discussion later. And so, hmm, let's see. Um, so first, uh, recently when I was giving a talk and there was an international student from China who asked me this question. And they asked like, what is wrong with Chinese people celebrating Chinese National Day in the US? So I asked the students to elaborate. And they said that if they put up a Chinese flag or have some other celebratory gestures uh, for October 1st, National Day in the People's Republic, they will get questions from their American schoolmates accusing them of being blind to Beijing's human rights abuses. And they would get asked, how could you celebrate a country or a government when the government is so oppressive? And now before we address this question directly, I'm fascinated by the gesture itself of putting up a flag on National Day. Apparently there has been a trending hashtag on Chinese social media called a spot a national flag on National Day on US campus. Here, the nation itself is not being explicitly pointed out though there is no ambiguity which nation this is being referred to. And I'm not going to second guess the sincerity of this gesture or cast it in the lens of great power politics when a lot of discussions about China and Chinese people in the US are being portrayed here. What interests me is that in the 19 years I lived in China, I've never seen a neighbor or anyone, uh, a classmate put up a flag on National Day. This is a day in my memory uh, which was, has been rather commercialized and commodified when people get a few days off from work or school and then stores would offer discounts. And this of course still continues to this day like this uh, image that was published by Xinhua just last year we see people wearing masks and then we're buying uh, discounted luxury French cosmetics on National Day during the holidays. And so I realized also the fact that I did not give National Day or my Chinese identity much thought in my youth which was also actually a sign of privilege. I'm Han Chinese. I grew up in the central Eastern province. I did not always know what being Chinese meant, but my Chineseness was never in doubt. This would not be the case had I been a member of the ethnic minorities uh, for people in the borderlands or those whose identities and lived experiences are in tension with the type of Chineseness that is being defined by the center, by the state. Actually, the first time when I felt acutely Chinese in relation to the Chinese state was when I was preparing to come to the US for graduate school. And I held my Chinese passport, which read here that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the China People's Republic of China requests all civil and military authorities of foreign countries to allow the bearer of this passport to pass freely and afford assistance in case of need. And now I did not have any illusions about the nature of the Chinese state or any state in general, whether like the state is not a benevolent entity. But I felt in that moment that my existence in this world, my legal existence was substantiated by the power of a state authority. That of course was when I was preparing to leave China. So there is a saying, Chu guo jiu ai guo. One becomes patriotic the moment one goes abroad. 
It is at the border and the act of crossing it that national identity comes into sharp focus. So for this talk, I will share three stories at three different points in time when a Chinese person crossed borders. And this was at a time when the maps of the world were being redrawn to explore what it means to be Chinese. So the first point is, again, we go back to the imperial era, but the late imperial era in the late 19th century. And here, um, this map, the, the note reads, complete map of the 23 provinces of the Qing Great State, plus a provincial map of Korea. So when this map was drawn around 1885, Korea was still a vassal state of the Qing Empire. And this uh, changed um, in, during the first Sino-Japanese War a decade later, after which Japan controlled Korea for many decades. But at the time when this map was drawn, um, the Qing had suffered many devastating battleground losses against European forces. However, the losses were devastating but not yet fatal. This was a time when the centuries old sense of cultural superiority held by Chinese literati was shaken, but still intact. And this was also during the time of the so-called Yang Wu Yundong self-strengthening movement led by reformers in the Qing court, which was best summed by this unofficial slogan by the Qing scholar Wei Yuan before the movement started, Shi Yi Chang Ji Yi Zhi Yi, learn advanced technology from foreign barbarians to keep barbarian invaders at bay. So among the many initiatives during the self-strengthening movement, one of them was the first overseas education mission sponsored by the Chinese government, the Chinese Educational Mission. So in 1872, a group of Chinese boys aged 10 to 16 set sail from Shanghai to San Francisco. A total of 120 boys would come to stay, uh, study in the US in the years that ensued. The idea was that after they graduate, they will go back to China to serve uh, the Qing Empire and to help with the empire's industrial and military modernization. Growing accustomed to life in the US, many of the boys started picking up habits, including playing baseball. And I should take note here that I saw on the front page of the China Center here that uh, when the first Chinese students, well, this was in the 20th century in 1914, if I remember correctly, arrived at the University of Minnesota, and they also joined the soccer team. So sports is something that transcends cultures and boundaries for, and this has been the case for a very long time. So quite a number of the Chinese boys when they arrived in the US and a lot of them studied in, in the New, New England, especially around Connecticut close to where I am now. And um, they played baseball and uh, which included this gentleman on the right here. And his, um, he was at Phys Felix, Phillips Academy in Massachusetts, and then, then he played baseball. His name was um, Liang Cheng, and he was most, his baseball achievements was best known for scoring a winning hit in a game against the school's rival, Exeter, in 1881. And when, after he scored a winning hit, supporters of Exeter shouted racial slurs at uh, the teenage Liang from the observer stands. Um, but the greatest immediate challenge Liang Cheng and his cohort faced, arguably, was not the rising anti-Chinese racism in the US, but conservative obstruction at home. Qing officials feared that the boys were becoming too Americanized, too Westernized. Playing baseball becomes a politically suspect act. And the program was abruptly shut down in 1881, just on the eve of the Chinese Exclusion Act. The boys were recalled to China. Upon arrival, they were detained by Qing authorities and questioned about their loyalty to the throne. A prominent newspaper in Shanghai, Shenbao, called the boys self half-breeds and suggested that they be exiled. And this reminds me of this famous poem, um, Diaspora Blues, too foreign for home, too foreign for here, never enough for both. Well, but the boys with their skills, with their training, they were still put into work at railroads and mines and in the Navy or in Qing government. Liang Cheng in particular joined the Qing's foreign service and rose quickly. And in 1902, he was appointed Qing's ambassador to the US. And here we see a photo of Liang boarding a train from Union Station in Chicago on, on his way to DC in 1903. Uh, when Liang, Liang Chen was appointed ambas Qing's ambassador to the US at a critical time in history. The year before, as the Qing capital of Beijing was occupied by foreign, 
by foreign forces. In response to the siege by the boxers, the Qing government was forced to sign the Boxer Protocol, the most expensive and humiliating among the quote unquote unequal treaties from that era that the Qing government was subject to. Among the long list of concessions, it inc um, included paying 450 million taels of silver, the equivalent of two times the Qing's annual income to the eight occupying powers, including the US. In the years that followed, there was an acknowledgement in the inside the US government that the indemnity was set too high. And Ambassador Liang Chen helped negotiate the repayments. His baseball experience came in handy as he was able to bond with President Teddy Roosevelt at the time through their mutual love of the sport. In the end, the US Congress decided that the repayment would be beneficial to bilateral relations in a complicated geopolitical climate. And, but that the repayment should be dictated on US terms and it should be spent on education as a way to help civilize the backwards Chinese people. So the bulk of the repayment went towards establishing a, university, uh, a college, which later became Tsinghua University, uh, the so-called MIT of China. While the remainder went to a scholarship for Chinese students to come to study in the US. Tsinghua was founded in 1911. The following year, Qin was overthrown and the Republic of China was born. Liang retired to his hometown in Guangzhou and later died uh, a few years later in what was then British Hong Kong. Inside China, reform had given way to revolution and it was happening at the heart of Chinese identity. Alongside an emerging national consciousness, many progressive Chinese intellectuals saw Chinese tradition as outdated and as the cultural apertures holding the country back. And they looked to the West for tools of national salvation. So from here, we come to our second story. During the Republic of China. And this, this is a map uh, that was issued in the late 1940s after World War II. Now through these um, four decades when China was um, ostensibly ruled by, by uh, uh, the Republic of China nationalist government though in different degrees of sovereignty. Uh, the, national, the, the Republic of China did inherit much of the map from the Qin Empire. Uh, so the map of China at the time looked like the shape of a begonia leaf Chou Hai Tang. And most, notab uh, most notably, uh, later the nationalist leader Chiang Kai-shek was not shy about their territorial ambitions and aspired to a vast multi-ethnic state. Though during this time, the nationalist government never really had full control over the entire territory it claimed. And in 1945, at the end, um, after, uh, at the end of World War II, a young man named Chen Yang graduated from Tsinghua and received a Boxer Indemnity Scholarship and came to the US to study. He pursued his PhD in physics at University of Chicago, which is my alma mater, but that was also Yang's father's alma mater where he received his PhD in mathematics um, um, in the 1920s. And for Yang and his small cohort of overseas Chinese scientists, they had arrived in the US as citizens of the Republic of China, which was a major US ally during World War II. But as the civil war in China raged on and the nationalists were losing to the communists, the Chinese scientists position in the US also became politically suspect. These scientists, of course, they took no part in the communist revolution, but to be racialized is to endure perpetual foreignness, to be tethered to an ancestral homeland and implicated in its every ill. The overseas scientists faced a pressing dilemma, whether they should return to the war-torn homeland and help it rebuild, despite its lack of resources, as well as the political uncertainty with the new communist government. Or they could try to stay in the US and endure racial hostilities and political suspicion, endure the second class status, but still enjoy relative political stability and material abundance. Very notably, relatively few overseas Chinese scientists followed the nationalist government to Taiwan. Their love and longing was for the land of their birth and its people, not the state that ruled it. Hundreds of overseas Chinese scientists in, this, in the following few years between the uh, establishment of the People's Republic of China to the early 1950s, before the Korean War broke out and 
the U.S. government effectively banned over, uh, Chinese scientists in the U.S. from returning for fear of technology transfer. So through that uh, short period of time, hundreds of overseas Chinese scientists returned to China, which included Yang's best friend, uh, Deng Jiaxian, who became a leader in the Chinese nuclear program. Yang, however, stayed in the US. And in 1957, he and his schoolmate Chen Daoli became the first two Chinese Nobel laureates. Newspapers in the US, in Taiwan, and in Beijing all tried to claim their victory as a sign of their national strength. At the Nobel banquet, Yang invoked the painful history of foreign invasion and occupation in China, noting that the Nobel Prize started in 1901, the signing, also the year of the signing of the Boxer Protocol whose legacy Yang's own education owed a great deal to. So at the Nobel banquet, in conclusion to his banquet speech, Yang said, as I stand here today and tell you about these, I am heavy with an awareness of the fact that I am in more than one sense, a product of both the Chinese and Western cultures in harmony and in conflict. Yang became a naturalized U.S. citizen in 1964, and in 1971, as U.S.-China relations thawed, so after Kissinger's uh, meeting, uh, first visit, um, he uh, Yang became the first Chinese-American scientist to visit his home uh, birth country. He visited China regularly in the years that ensued and met with the highest levels of the Chinese government. Many other Chinese-American scientists soon followed, visiting their homeland for the first time in the quarter of a century. I would look at photos and press reports from that time, like this image of Yang here smiling and shaking hands with Mao, and wonder whether the Chinese American scientists were aware of the devastation the new communist government had wreaked on their birth country, the famine and the political purges, their former classmates and colleagues who chose China decades before, who were toiling away at labor camps. In participating state, is participating in state propaganda too high a price to pay or visit home? Is it a worthy bargain to contribute to the development of science and education in China by collaborating with a government despite its many abuses? These are very difficult questions with no easy answers. In the, first two, uh, in the early 2000s, Yang moved back to China to teach at his alma mater, Tsinghua. He later renounced his US citizenship and became a citizen of the People's Republic of China, a state he was never a citizen of before. Yang had recalled how his own father never forgave him for becoming a naturalized US citizen. Back in 1957, uh, the year Yang won the Nobel Prize, Yang's father visited his son in Geneva, Switzerland, and left his son and his daughter-in-law with this note. This note reads, at every meal, do not forget the eternal love of your dearest. In this life, you should thank the country for its generosity. So I wonder what country here is Yang's father referring to? For a man of Yang's father's age who was born in the final years of the Qing Empire, by 1957, he had seen many wars. He had seen the government of his homeland change hands multiple times and the borders redrawn each time. I would like to think that his allegiance was to the land, its people, culture, and language, that he believed in a China as a continuous project, and for that he was willing to overlook the contradictions. But as it so happened, Yang was from my hometown of Hefei, and so it was also in his position as central and in the majority that he did not have to face as much the rough and shifting edges of Chineseness. And from here we come to the present day. And this is a map that's issued uh, by the People's Republic of China by the, China, by the government in Beijing. And this was drawn and approved in 2019 with all of its territorial claims, with all the lines and dashes on land and in sea. But as we've discussed so far, a map is not the only story. It is only one snapshot in time seen from a particular point of view. The two men we've discussed, Liang Chen and Yang Zheng, they are extraordinary. They have made history themselves. The next character is, well, is quite ordinary. At least of one month ago, he did not set out to make history. But by circumstance, he found himself in the middle of history as it's taking place. So this is Wang Jixian. He is a 37-year-old computer programmer who's originally from Beijing. 
and his job brought him to Odessa, Ukraine four years ago. Since the Russian invasion started a month ago, he's been posting short videos on YouTube and on Chinese social media platforms, describing his firsthand experience. Now, China is not in principle a party to this war. And in a reasonable world, Beijing should not care what one of its citizens say about Vladimir Putin or um, the criticism of Putin or the praise of the brave, bra bravery and humanity of the Ukrainian people. But because of complicated geopolitical calculations made by Beijing, which also resonates with a considerable portion of the Chinese public that see the US and NATO as primary aggressors on the world stage and Sino-Russian relations as something that's strategically advantageous. Once videos describing his, the damages of the war that he witnessed or heard and his harsh criticism of the Putin regime were being seen as something incorrect. One has faced backlash from Chinese nationalists and his accounts on Chinese social media were all deleted, which were also his only means of keeping in touch with his family in China. So when I watch uh, Wang's videos as the war escalates and comes closer to where he is, his tone has also turned increasingly defiant. In a video on March 12th, he opened by addressing an invisible audience and we can guess whom he was addressing since he does speak in Chinese. I'm Ji Xian, I live in Ukraine. Who are you? What are you so afraid of? Why are you so afraid of me being able to speak? Why are you so afraid of knowing the truth? One speaks with a rather distinct style. He is from Beijing, he has a Beijing accent, and he often invokes revolutionaries of the former uh, century, of the early 20th century, including some of the founders of the Chinese Communist Party, Chen Duxiu, Li Dazhao, who, um, including some who later fell out of favor with party doctrine. He also often quotes this 11th century, the Song era Chinese scholar, Zhang Zai, his famous Heng Qu Si Ju. The four lines here, Wei Tian Di Li Xing, Wei Sheng Ming Li Ming, Wei Wang Sheng Ji Jue Xue, Wei Wan Shi Kai Tai Ping. He has translated by the Sinologist uh, Jeremy Bame, nurture a heart that can embrace, can embrace both heaven and earth, devote yourself to the betterment of all, inherit the teachings of sages past loss to the present, contribute thereby to lasting peace. And now this quote, when I hear it in one's videos, it actually touches me greatly because this quote happened to be a favorite of my middle school Chinese teachers, who was also from Beijing and was a sent down youth during the Cultural Revolution. So he and Wang actually sounded quite a bit alike with their Beijing accent. And when I watch Wang's videos, I realize that this is someone who is unapologetically Chinese. And again, I want to emphasize that I do not want to put one on a pedestal and make him into a symbol, make him into some kind of token of protest, since this, was an this is an ordinary guy. And I do not want to make his life some that's only about these brave moments of defiance in face of great danger. But I do acknowledge the sense of Chineseness that he expressed in his videos it's a Chineseness that does not easily conform to the dictates of the state. I would again quote Jeremy Bame here in his, uh, he has written and translated two lovely essays on China File, which I would encourage everyone to uh, read, which also includes translations of some of one's monologues in his videos. Jeremy writes that one represents, quote, the other China, a China of humanity and decency, of quiet dignity and unflappable perseverance. A China that finds expression in myriad ways in a country dominated by a political party that would bend all to its will. Now, for those of us who are only watching the tragedy of the war from afar, and I should take note here that this is exactly one month to the date that the Russian invasion of Ukraine started, with thousands dead and millions displaced. When we have the fortune of still being in relative safety and watching it, as a distant observer, we inevitably relate to the events from our own positions and perspectives. Many Taiwanese people, now of course I should also emphasize that Taiwan is not Ukraine, but many Taiwanese people have understandably felt a, a certain sense of, uh, of, of insecurity and a pressing concern for their future safety. 
And I myself, as a Chinese person, on one hand, I am alarmed hearing, say, Putin, some of Putin's speeches of how nostalgia for a lost empire can be dangerous, how history, language, and culture can be weaponized to justify a state's aggressions. On the other hand, I'm also dismayed and saddened by how people can become victims of the state in different ways. The Ukrainian people and the Russian people are both victims of the Russian state, of course, in very different ways and to very different degrees. A people can simultaneously be victimized by the state and also complicit in the state's actions. So one unfortunate development that's been spinning off the Russian invasion of Ukraine is that Russian people outside of Russia, Russian art and literature are also facing backlash. There is a very popular restaurant in Chicago. And when I was living in the city, this is also one that I've been to, and it's wonderful. I would encourage everyone if I have a chance, visit Russian Tea Time in Chicago. And however, after Putin's war started, it has faced um, backlash. And the sad irony here is that the founder of the restaurant and many of his staff are actually Ukrainian and still have family in Ukraine. Of course, had the restaurant being run and by Russians, it would still be wrong to fault Russians in Chicago for Putin's war in Ukraine. This unfortunate development, of course, it on one hand shows the gradient and hierarchies within whiteness itself. That being white is not a singular static concept. But one can also see in this incident and easily draw parallels to the escalating violence and hostility the Asian community in the US have been facing over the past few years. This on the immediate term is exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and deteriorating US-China relations. But it can also trace the roots of these hostilities to the centuries old racism and imperialism, including the US military's many wars in Asia through the 20th century. And there is this long held perception as long as there have been Asian immigrants on this continent, that foreign bodies are carriers of disease. Many Asians in the US, regardless of their ethnicity, citizenship, regardless of their relations to, the Chinese, to China, the country or the Chinese state, as long as they may look Asian to white eyes, have been uh, encountered situations like noted in this tweet that they are confronted, usually by a white person, to condemn or somehow answer for Beijing's actions. So this brings us to the question at the beginning of this talk. What is wrong with expressing national pride as a Chinese person on Chinese National Day? Now, I'm reminded of this famous speech by Frederick Douglass that he gave in Rochester in 1852, the day after Independence Day on July 5th, where he asked, what to the American slave is your 4th of July? He went on to say that your celebration is a sham. Your shouts, your shouts of liberty and equality hollow mockery. That this 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn. Now, I think that the American students who confront and question their Chinese schoolmates about their expressions of patriotism on Chinese National Day, in this situation, I think the American students were probably not raising the same, the same hard questions about themselves or about these venerated American holidays, be it the 4th of July or Thanksgiving. They press the questions they cannot answer themselves to their Chinese schoolmates as an act of harassment, as a way to show and prove their moral superiority, which is of course also coded in racial superiority. However, for a Chinese person, the question of what National Day means for different people with different relations to the Chinese state is exactly what we should be asking ourselves. No one would be able to answer this question except for, our, uh, for us. And here in answer to this question, I found three photos on the same national day, October 1st of 2019, which was the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. In Beijing, there was this grand military parade. My mother in China did watch the live stream on TV and said the grandeur of the occasion moved her to tears. I understand the sincerity of her pride and her love for her country, which is also my country. 
And so I do not ask her where or to whom does she imagine these weapons to be pointed at. That same day in Hong Kong, there was a massive protest and the police cracked down and clashed with the protesters violently. Since the 1997 handover, the dates important to the Chinese state, important to Beijing, October 1st, National Day, July the 1st, the birthday of the Chinese Communist Party and also the date of the handover, as well as June 4th, the date of the Tiananmen crackdown, have always seen demonstrations in Hong Kong. But 2019 was also the last year that the la these large scale protests could still happen in Hong Kong. As the following year, the national security law was enacted and any form of political dissent could potentially violate the law. On that same day, there was also this um, activity at a factory in Shandong on the eastern tip of China. This factory had uh, by then received over 800 ethnic minorities from the northwestern region of Xinjiang, uh, most of them Uyghurs or Kazakhis. And this uh, Xinjiang was first drawn into Chinese territory, also as a part of the Qing Empire's westward expansion and military conquest. And in recent years, the Chinese government has been forcefully erasing the identities and cult cultures of the indigenous people in this region using practices that are aided by new technology as such as like biometric surveillance. But at its core, these methods are actually rather similar to the practices European settlers have treated Native Americans on this continent. And so I know that uh, when we think about these different facts in relation to Chinese National Day, these are very difficult facts to reckon with. And for a Han Chinese person like myself, born and raised on the mainland, thinking about these would inevitably lead to a deep sense of guilt that I'm complicit in my identity. But here I'd venture to say that it's much better to feel burdened by truth than to claim innocence based on lies. I remember when I was so new to the US and I went to a talk um, at the University of Chicago, a panel discussion on the legacy of Thomas Jefferson. And a central theme of the discussion was on whether or not Thomas Jefferson had sexual relations and bore offspring with his slaves. And there was this one particular panelist, an elder white gentleman, who grew incredibly incensed and he was red in the face and shouting from the panel saying, how could you possibly say one of our great founding fathers, the drafter of the Declaration of Independence, one of the first presidents, this and that Thomas Jefferson would have such inappropriate relations with his slaves. Now, at that time, I was still very new to this country. I did not know much about US history. I did not know much about the history of slavery. I did not know very much about the work or life of Thomas Jefferson. What I became very interested in, curious about in that moment, was why this particular panelist would take on historical facts on Thomas Jefferson's life as a form of personal insult. It uh, took me quite a long time as I read and learned more about US history and all the um, bright and, and darkness, brightness and darkness of it, all the hypocrisies and these um, different narratives for me to understand that, that for that particular panelist, what he really cared about was not Thomas Jefferson's life or what Thomas Jefferson did or did not do. His, in, his incense, his outrage at that moment was about himself, that his identity, his idea, his understanding of his country of himself and himself, his worldview and his own place in it was based on this idea of a whitewashed American history. And that was why he took a historical fact, a discussion on Thomas Jefferson's personal life as a personal insult to himself centuries later. And so coming back to the idea of China in relation to the Chinese state and the many dimensions of it. To understand what it means to be Chinese is also to reckon with its many com complexities. To understand oneself is to examine one's position in these intricate interwoven structures of power in this world. Relations of power shapes language, shapes culture, determines how maps are drawn and how history is written. The Chinese state has its own narrative, 
but Chineseness is too rich and too important to let the state monopolize its definition. And here we come to the concluding slide about the multitudes of being Chinese. And I saw this photo on Twitter recently posted by a parent in Hong Kong whose child, whose elementary school age child's uh, textbook features this question, what makes you Chinese? And in this, imagine that this text, um, there are four young children who gave their answers, uh, diff four different answers to the same question, what makes you Chinese? The first child said, I have black eyes, black hair, and yellow skin. The second child said, I write Chinese. The third child said, because my father and my mother are Chinese, so I'm also Chinese. And the fourth child said, I was born in, Ch in Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is a part of China, and that is why I'm Chinese. And to quote my colleague Rachel Liao, this is a really powerful construct that relates to biology, to blood, tongue, roots, and soil in terms of defining Chineseness. It is a powerful concept of Chineseness as biology, as language, as ancestry and citizenship, as territorial claims. Um, it is very expansive in scope that is contained on this simple page or in the children's textbook. As, as if anyone who shares any of the four traits becomes Zhongguoren, who is not just Chinese, but a Chinese national. However, in reducing Chineseness to this relation with the Chinese state, it is also rather limiting in its imagination of what Chineseness is or can be. And so here, I would refer to a list made by my uh, uh, colleague, Professor Gregory Lee at the University of St. Andrews, that um, the word China or Chinese in the English language as a singular word, but may respond to at least 14 different things in the Chinese language. It can relate to, to different things with regards to culture, to literature and languages, to citizenship and ethnicity. And it would indeed be a great disservice and a great loss to Chineseness and to humanity to collapse all of them under the authority of the Chinese state or any state. I would like here to conclude with a quote from Benedict Anderson's classic, Imagined Communities, where he talked about language, the language of political love as we were talking about national pride and patriotism from the beginning. In describing kingship and home, the language of political love may seem natural, like what we are seeing in this example of the Hong Kong textbook. But, quote, in everything natural, there is always something unchosen, unquote. So there is always a border that polices and excludes. Now, the word Chinese, in its varied meanings, is also a porous concept. It can be interpreted in different ways. In this sense, it can be a welcoming concept. It transcends borders. In times of war and geopolitical upheaval, borders harden. States always rely on the border to exercise and preserve its power. A map drawn by, the, by state authorities provides a powerful narrative. And for many of us who are feeling lost or insecure about our place in the world, about the state of things, a map can offer easy passage in a perilous world. It can be very appealing. However, I guess my concluding note for this talk is to say, reject this simple narrative, reject this com comforting self-congratulatory story, to always be skeptical when someone seems to have all the answers to some of the most difficult questions about history and about identity, which is about the past and the present and also about the future. To find out who one is and one's place in the world is always a work in progress. I too am on this journey. Solidarity in struggle. Thank you very much. Okay, welcome back and my goodness, thank you, Dr. Chung. That was really a, a fascinating overview and, and a certainly a lovely discussion of um, all the uh, wonderful aspects of Chinese-ness. <laughs> thank you for sharing your journey and also for um, giving us that review. We're welcoming questions at this point. So if you wanna put Q&A at the bottom, uh, push the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and ask your question. 
we'll get that to Dr. Chung. And she did say she can stick around a little bit later today. So if you have, um, we have lots of questions. We hope to get to all of them. Thanks very much. Joan, I can start. Oh, okay, good. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Chung, it was fascinating. I, I would have liked to listen to you for another hour. Um, so I, I, I was really intrigued by the stories that you told and it was a, um, such a nice way of pointing out the dilemmas that people who uh, take on dual citizenship and or give up another citizenship face in their lives. And um, you're tying them to the points in history helped, I think people understand the, the, the dilemmas that people were going through. And I'm wondering, to, to pick those three, did you look at a number of stories like this? I mean, I, let me frame the question a little more. I think there's a lot of Americans who think uh, everybody wants to be an American. Why wouldn't you? If you can get out of your country, which isn't as great as America, then you come and be American, because why wouldn't you? Um, and so this idea that people choose it for a lot of reasons, not necessarily to avoid what was going on in their own country, but for just a lot of reasons, as you described. And then choosing to go back, those are different paths. So it seems to me there must be a lot of individuals or individual stories that you are aware of or that you found in your research. And, and is that true? Did you kind of pick these three because they're different and similar? Or maybe you could talk a little bit about that aspect of your talk. Mm -hmm. Thank, thanks so much for, for the very kind words and for this really thoughtful question. So um, first of all, before I answer with regards to the individual stories that I chose for this talk, I want to mention a bit in terms of the, the idea of, um, of, of American exceptionalism and, and this idea like, um, and I understand this is a potent concept. When I was a, a young girl growing up in China, I was also uh, drawn to, to the appeal of this concept. But the United States as a nation of immigrants was really not, not accurate. And one might say it's actually an, a, a lovely fabrication. It, but it is something that sounds much better than say this is a nation of settlers, refugees, and, and slaves built on the land of uncolonized, <laughs> uh, 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 um, unyielded native land. And so, but then, of course, people uh, when they come to to this country and and find their forge their identities, there are also narratives that are um, th that are comforting that that make them feel good about who they are and and about their country. And and these are the nar uh, narratives that are also uh, useful to the forces of the state. And that is why they become the dominant narratives. And so in, in and then coming to the part about the individuals that I chose for this, uh, for this talk, of course, like even if we just look at these three different snapshots in history, of course, the last one is about the present. Even in the, in uh, in that sense, it was just like, oh, there are 120 boys in the Chinese educational mission. There were hundreds of Chinese and overseas Chinese scientists at, at, at the at, in the mid 20th century facing this dilemma of whether to stay in the West or go back to China. And then in the present day, of course, like Wang Zhixian is in a particular position as a Chinese person still in, still in Ukraine and choosing to stay. But in any of these snapshots in time, there would be other individuals uh, who may have um, similar stories that had this being a book or um, a, a, um, a class um, and then then these are the stories that we uh, we may go uh, we may go into as well um, but I chose these um, particular these particular three three stories in particular those two in, in history um, because uh, they th their lives contain so much uh, in, in, in relations to both the the governments of um, of the U.S. and also the government of China, and and through changes as well in their lifetimes. Okay, could you please comment on your view of the role of non-governmental organizations, sister cities, academia, in carrying the burden of keeping people to people perceptions and relationships open and constructive? Hmm. Um, this is a really great question. So I would speak mostly on, on the role of academia because that is uh, my, my profession and that is like the, the institution I'm most familiar with. I've, I've never worked in, in an NGO and so I probably only have a very amateurish understanding of it. 
Um, but but speaking of the academy, it's actually something that I think about a lot. And I know that Joan, in your uh, earlier introduction, you very generously mentioned that I wrote an essay for the Atlantic last fall about academic freedom, and especially in the context of China, um, uh, a ch potential Chinese state influence or, or the presence of Chinese students and scholars in the US and how the idea of China, including like the Cultural Revolution are being tokenized and used in, uh, in wrong and inappropriate ways to describe the speech situation here in the US. And so I think a lot about the, the issue of academic freedom and about the role of the academy. And I've always seen myself, I am an academic and that's, that's the only profession I've worked in. Um, but I do, I, I see that as the academy plays a vital role in society that no other institution can play. I now work at at Yale, this is an institution that was founded that predates the Declaration of in Independence and, and, and the US Constitution. And of course, it also bears the legacy of colonialism and slavery that marks this campus. And so this is a complex legacy that I need to reckon with. And as earlier I mentioned, right, like uh, Tsinghua it was founded in 1911 at the tail end of the, of the Qin Empire for the oldest institutions of higher learning on, on uh, any continent based basically they, they outlive the, the state. And so there is, a, and, and I think about this an essay by the historian Robin D.G. Kelly, the proletariat goes to university. When he writes about the academy, it was always the place where alternative forms of the government, where different, uh, different better futures can be imagined, where the current system can be challenged um, in, in every way that it, it should be. And, and I do see that, um, the, the, the academy at its best has always contested, challenged and transcended the state. And I refer, I think the one person whose idea of academic freedom has played the most important, um, has been the most important inspiration for me is Edward Said, where he talked about how the uh, social responsibilities of an intellectual, that the true intellectual is an exile. And here by exile, he doesn't mean just in, in the legal or the political sense, though many are, but he meant that in the sense of being outside structures of power and always contesting existing structures of power. And he writes about academic freedom in the sense of um, the, the traveler and the potentate of how when we already live in a world that is dominated by nations, when the state of the narratives of the state are foregrounded, then it becomes particularly important, particularly important for, for members of the academy to transcend that, to be in ownership of none, but being at home in all. Thank you. I'm gonna try to combine two of these questions. Um, as many of our Chinese students and scholars are discovering what it means to be Chinese for them personally. I wonder what if the question should be, what does it mean to be Chinese for you? Is that a good reflection question or is the question that could be seen negatively? And then someone asked to give a definition of what Chinese characteristics might be. And I think they're kind of related. Uh, so if I understand it correctly, the first question, is it addressed to, to me as in how I see my own Chineseness? I think the idea is, um, not what does it mean to be Chinese, but what does it mean to be Chinese to the individual or to the ah, person? That should be the question. Um, if I misspoke, you can correct me. In a uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm super bad at, at keeping track of the, uh, the, the various messages that, that scroll up and down on, the, on Zoom window. So um, I really appreciate, uh, Joan, your help in, in, in keeping track of the questions. And so, um, so the first question in terms of what it means to be Chinese as an individual, I think that's why like, I asked whether it's addressed to me, because first of all, I would still answer it in terms of what I see, like I, I, I am Chinese, I'm also a, a Chinese citizen. Um, but so, so in the political and legal sense, I, I, I am Chinese um, by, by view of, of any government. Um, but, but I always see my own, my, myself, my Chinese identity is a, uh, is a cultural and linguistic belonging. It's something that's rooted in 3000 years of words and song. It's something that transcends many kings and empires and many forms of government, many different borders and, and maps. And of course, I'm also a woman. And so I also, 
uh, sense that this weight of history there that for for uh, for Chinese women over millennia, uh, most of them, and also for 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 Chinese men as well who didn't have the resources were denied access to this three thousand years of words and so on, to this access to literacy, um, to this uh, to this ability to uh, to write their own narratives and and construct their their own history, and so. So this is some. Uh, so this is something that is very important to me, and that that is where I ground. I, I ground my sense of identity, and of course, that identity is constantly in tension with how Chinese is being defined, either by Beijing or uh, or by Washington or Brussels or by different political entities to their own agendas. And and I think that that tension by itself is something for an academic, also intellectually uh, enticing and 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 important. And then I think um, for, and then more generally, what does being Chinese mean for an individual? This is something that I think it is an individual question and, and it has an individual answer. And, and every individual who do identify as Chinese needs to answer that for themselves, what their Chineseness means. And as I mentioned in the last slide, where Ch Chinese in English encompasses so many different concepts and definitions in the Chinese language or languages, and um, and that that by, uh, is a is something to take note of, but it can also be turned as an advantage that this is a welcoming, uh, porous, shifting concept that that different people can define their Chineseness in different ways. And then I think that the second question is about Chinese characteristics. But that I think that's actually an interesting question because this phrase like Zhongguo Tesu, it's not indigenous or grassroots uh, grounds up, right? This is a top-down narrative as imposed by the state. It's a way for, for, for the Chinese state to justify its forms of governance and anything that doesn't uh, conform to, uh, to, to how, whether it's Marxism or socialism or this and that, it doesn't uh, conform to, to what this concept is usually being understood or, or just in general, like it, as long as being cast into Chinese characteristics. So there is also, uh, this is also a common practice by the Chinese government, this form of self-orientalizing to uh, refer to this quote unquote Te Shu Guoqing, the special national conditions of the of the Chinese society, of the country and its people. And that's why its form of governance is justified. And I think this needs to be understood first and foremost as a political strategy. And then it's to be contested both by the Chinese people, but and also um, criticism from outside of China is also valid. But for criticism outside of China is needs also needs to be understood that uh, uh, that at times this is being used as, as a political tool to advance the political agendas of foreign governments as well. Complicated. <laughs> um, can you compare the concepts of American and Chinese exceptionalism? Ooh. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a short answer, but go ahead. <laughs> this, is, this, is actually, this is such an interesting question because um, I think I think not that many countries in the world in the present day have that sense of of exception exceptionalism to the extent of uh, the Chinese state or Chinese society or American society. Of course, um, uh, for for every. Um, Every nation would resort to different forms of myth building to, to create a narrative um, as a way of, of creating this quote unquote imagined community as a way to, uh, to, to create and enhance national cohesion. Um, I, 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 think, I think what is, um, what is interesting here is of course, um, these are, um, of course, United States, um, is a, a settler colonial uh, state and and so so it needs to to create um, a, a past that find, find some way to bridge this this violent rupture and still make itself seem like the good person and and this is, uh, something that is different from, from, from the case of Chineseness. But here I should also emphasize that probably um, for the context of this discussion is the idea of, of empire and the legacies of empire. 
needs to be understood as not an exclusively Western or, Euro or European concept. Uh, uh, China for the, the region, the, the place we call China today was ruled by different empires over millennia. And, and, so, uh, and, and so the the borders that we uh, draw for, for the People's Republic now, a lot of it is a result of previous imperial conquest and military aggressions. And so th that is um, a historical fact. And I think that needs to be acknowledged as well that, um, um, and, and that's something um, I, I think that's probably the, the more constructive part is to have less self-exoticizing, to not exoticize the other, but also not essentialize the self, not essentialize any cultures, but see how people, um, even if they their countries and their societies developed under different political systems and in different contexts, but do share a lot of similarities. Um, and I think it's probably more important to see these continuities, but also put them into different contexts. Thank you. So the next person says, my personal and very limited observation of Chinese ultra-nationalists suggests that they are paradoxically anti-West and anti-American and despise white leftists and liberals, yet they subscribe to a social Darwinist worldview and various kinds of racism that won't be out of place in the Western far right fringe groups. What insight do you have into this phenomenon? Hmm. This is such a great question. Um, I think I, I think this uh, one 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 interesting uh, phenomenon that that we've seen. Uh, this is not just about uh, about China, including uh, on January sixth uh, last year during the, the riots at Capitol Hill. There were uh, South Vietnamese flags being flown. There were Chinese uh, overseas Chinese quote unquote dissidents who were present in, in this uh, uh, right wing extremist. Um, who <laughs> essentially and and so so I think this is um this is an it, this is an interesting phenomenon but it may seem extremely uh, confusing and how uh, especially on the part of like say say, uh, say South Vietnamese uh, or uh, or uh, Chinese citizens who seem to be opposing the authoritarian government in their birth countries um, but somehow uh, supporting a, a proto-fascist uh, here in the US. However, I think this is actually continuous. It's not it, it's ideologically consistent that what these people want is not really freedom, um, but power. And it's power in that, uh, in that crude, militant, cynical sense. And so it comes back to, or, and I think the questioner asked about like the idea of, of social Darwinism. And the social Darwinism first became really popular in China at the time of the 20th century. And this was a time when the country was uh, going through a lot of internal turmoil as well as facing foreign aggression and 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 there was a, it was a country under siege and it, there was a sense of, of bereavement and, and 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 grief and a lot of indeed patriotic and progressive Chinese intellectuals looked to, to the West. And because it was in a context of war where ideas of power was being cast into this hardened cynical sense. And so a lot of, uh, a lot of Chinese intellectuals also uh, ascribed to that, that they saw the Western powers uh, in that sense, also including Japan in the, in the political and, and military sense, uh, were, were winning the wars and, and with, with their industrialized, militarized power. Power. And and that that became their their prescription for national salvation as well. And the legacies of that, of course, uh, still remains to this day, but in different forms. In terms of how um, in terms of how science and technology are viewed in, in China. In terms of also how the extreme. Uh, disparity in, in the allocation of social resources. And so a lot of people in. in in order to, to, to resort to a form of psychological self-defense mechanism to justify the unjust world they find themselves in would resort to these unhardened narratives of power of competition, this myth of meritocracy or social Darwinism and as a way to, to, to make sense of the world and their place in it. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the webinar. You talked about Chinese as in Huaren. Allegiance to the ancestral lands, languages, and cultures resonate with me. 
Um, at the same time, I'm sorry, I bumped up here. At the same time, I have seen Chinese identities rejected by Chinese people in the US due to the perceived ills constructed by US society. I'm wondering in regards to pride, how should one consider interweaving complexity of culture and national pride, especially when it's now interweaved with geopolitical and ideological issues, should one be prideful at all? Hmm. Maybe I did not fully understand the part about uh, Chinese-ness being rejected by, um, could you? <laughs> um, okay, I've seen <laughs> Chinese identity by Chinese identities rejected by Chinese people in the U.S. due to the perceived ills constructed by U.S. society. Mm. Okay, so um, with apologies if I misunderstood, but I would, um, uh, if I, so, so, so my understanding is that this is asking about like for, for people who uh, look Chinese or, or maybe of Chinese uh, ancestry or heritage in the US and, and who would like to assert their American identity uh, first and foremost. And then I think, I think this is a very uh, a natural thing and it's a, there is nothing wrong with that, but it is related to like, I would not talk so much about individual, but about the, the, the context of why this happens, right? Because people, because this is still a country that was founded and, and run on, on the racial hierarchy. So people who are, are, are who are, are not white, and as also we mentioned in the talk about like Russians and such, right? Whiteness itself is not a monolith, like who do not meet its own definition of whiteness. And the body is perceived as eternally alien and foreign. And so it is very understandable for, for a lot of uh, people of, of Chinese um, heritage in the US who are American by whether, whether by birth or by naturalization, but American legally, uh, or not, not in, in the sense of the passport, but in the sense of the, their standing in this country, that they are uh, as American as uh, anyone who look white and in this country. And who do not um, who do uh, who do not have their identities questioned, their presence in this country questioned, or seen as suspect that much. So I think the rejection of of Chinese ness is in response to uh, to, to the racism and, and xenophobia in in the U.S. And and I, I and then I don't remember what is the the latter part of the question. Uh, sorry. Um... It just should be one be prideful at all. How do how do we interweave the complexities oh, of dear, cultural yeah. and natural national pride, especially now that it, it is also interweaved with geopolitical and ideological issues. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think we we all we 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 exist in an unjust world. We all make our compromises in order to live. And of course, like, like, for example, like, like I still shop on Amazon, right? And that is a, an extremely unethical thing to do. And, but, but sometimes like, especially like uh, during COVID and, and such, like it's still, I still take advantage of its convenience. And, and then I reckon with that and maybe I am a, a hypocrite and, and I accept that. Um, but, uh, but, but so, so I think, I think we all make different, uh, different kinds of, 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 of compromises. And, and I, I think one thing that is also important, especially when, when China and um, uh, uh, Chinese people in the in the ethnic uh, sense are, are being um, viewed and treated uh, here in the US and a lot of times um, there, there there is a sense of um, taking political risks is being fetishized um, here in the US that, that, uh, especially someone like myself who is both uh, Chinese by ethnicity but also Chinese by birth that um, and then as an I'll say as an academic no one needs to like uh, criticize the worst abuses of the Chinese government in order to prove one's morality or one's um, uh, intellectual independence. And so, so I think um, regardless of one's area of research and like to, to be seen as not, not like one is de facto somehow an, an external agent of Beijing unless one does something and take on um, um, particular personal and professional risks to disprove that. And I think that, that expectation of course is based on, on racism. And and then I think in terms of making these practical uh, uh, choices and decisions, one should not submit to these racist uh, demands that are are unfair. Like um, if a person just looks Chinese but um, shouldn't um, bear any more or any less 
responsibility for what Beijing does than a person who looks white or, or of, of some other ethnicity in the US, right? And so, so that, that, that should be the baseline. And, and in time, but then in terms of, of geopolitics in general, I, I do feel there, there is an importance that um, because the states are already so powerful, we do live in a world that is dominated by nations. On one hand, we acknowledge and work with that reality. On the other hand, we should always, always be alert and aware of its, of, of its harm, of its violence, of its many contradictions. It is so, so important to preserve and extend the space in the margins because it is only through the margins that the hypocrisies of the present world are being exposed and a better future may be imagined and may be born. Great, right, thank you. Um, this is gonna be a combo question. Uh, it said, would you please comment on uh, one Olympian's uh, statement saying, I am Chinese when I'm in China and I'm American when I'm in the US. And then also another question following that just on the debates of Chineseness for Olympic athletes like Eileen Gu and Nathan Chen particularly. Hmm. <laughs> So first of all, I, I should say that uh, the, the, the Olympians are, are very young. And, and I think there is, a, they, are, they, they are very privileged. And I think people in positions of privilege and, and as public figures, uh, some degree of, of public scrutiny and, and even criticism are, are fair uh, for, for the nature of, of, uh, of their public profile. And then especially if they, they, are, they are public figures and make public statements that have public social consequences. However, I think for, for a teenager, like questions of national identity and allegiance is a complicated matter. And I think the expectation shouldn't be placed on, on a teenager to figure, to figure this out, especially when they're speaking in, in a public sense and they, a, a most likelihood um, have PR teams that uh, design these messages. What I think is more interesting is um, on one hand, um, for, for, um, for this particular Olympian, uh, her experience shows um, how for, for the global elite, for, for people who are extremely wealthy and, and connected and have other forms of privileges, they do live in a form of almost borderless world. So when, I, when we talk about the world that, that is without borders, without prisons or policing, and someone say it's idealistic, but it's not really that idealistic because the most privileged already live in that world. It is the most marginalized and, and under advantaged that face all these harsh, um, systems and organs of violence of the state. And so, so I think that is one lesson to take. And the other, um, I think is what is also interesting is also the, the public perception, right? It is, I think a lot of the public perception in China about what this Olympian is or does and the public perception in the US, um, the, the critique or, or different ideas, it's really not about this particular Olympian at all. It's about who they are and whom they, they see their place in the world, whom they are as Chinese, if they're in China or if they are uh, Americans in, in the US. Thank you. Um, here's a somewhat different question. Um, are there regional differences or what are the regional differences in China, if any, on how Chinese-ness is understood? Is there a different understanding shared amongst Chinese outside of China? So I, I think I think uh, so I guess one example I would give is in terms of language. And and I think I, I wrote this in, in an essay for, for The Guardian last year where I had this line where the, the Chinese language I speak, and I only speak one Chinese language, a uh, standard Mandarin uh, or, or Putonghua, it is as old as Chinese civilization and as young as the modern Chinese state. And, and this is a language that was um, was created <laughs> alongside like the, the, the Chinese nation in the modern sense in, in, the, in the early 20th century and, and, and through various iterations and changes into the mid 20th century. And, and, and at different points, different decisions uh, could be made differently. And, and partly why the language, uh, the, the, the standard official language is, is, is standard Mandarin is as a result of the, the position of political power where, because Beijing is the capital. And, and so other languages 
from regions that are further from the capital are, are marginalized. So there is a very interesting dynamic of the of the metropole and the colonies here in, in terms of the Chinese how the Chinese language uh, and Chinese languages are, are constructed. And I think it is also very important here to to mention that. Uh, when we say a Chinese language, it's really a, a misnomer, right? Because there are Sinitic languages and also because of the uh, <laughs> legacies of empires, there are also indigenous languages spoken in the territory we know as China today that are of, of different language systems that are not Sinitic languages. And, and I think what is very um, interesting is how the Chinese um, government has been using this narrative pushing other languages that are not standard Mandarin to call them not languages, but dialects. And this is a, a, a way of downgrading it. And in that downgrading is also a form of discounting and erasure of identities. And so I think to, to contest that is also very important. And I think this is the, the, the richness and variety of languages spoken in the territory of the People's Republic today is a good example of the regional differences and contrasts in hierarchies of political and economic power in China. Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to bridge this a little bit. A uh, little uh, great story showcasing the three people. Um, how would you see things evolving now that there's more competition between the US and China? Um, you know, for example, uh, Ambassador Liang and um, Xian Yang were a bridge between the two countries. But uh, today, if another scientist with a similar story as Yang, born in China, educated, worked in the US, and then traveled back and forth between China and the US, might be challenged for the potential conflict of interest, IP espionage. Would you, do you see this as a long lasting, given the US and China becoming closer and closer in competition, or will this be noise in the long run? Hmm. So first of all, I should say that uh, when Chen Yang became the first Chinese American scientist to visit his birth country in the early 1970s, and then he uh, visited regularly, each time he visited, he gets um, a meeting um, and a briefing with U.S. authorities and, and uh, federal agents afterwards, and he gets a lot of calls from, from the FBI uh, as well. So, so, so this uh, kind of suspicion and hostility is really not new that the FBI ran a decades long secret surveillance program of ethnic Chinese scientists in the US starting a dating back to the 1950s that continued to some extent in the, in the 1980s. And, and this was a period, of course, like there was not Chinese people coming to the US. These were people who had already, uh, were already in the US who came to the US as um, as citizens of the Republic of China who had no part in the Communist Revolution. And so they were, the, the, the scrutiny was based entirely on, on, their, on their race and, and ethnicity. And so, so this is not something, uh, this is not new. And I also should say that this is not exclusive to, to, to Chinese people. I think one thing that uh, and I have felt, uh, especially since COVID-19 started, it was like, oh, that may, that maybe now I can relate better to what it felt uh, to be Muslim in America after 9-11. And then, so I think it is also important to not see this as an exclusively um, contemporary Chinese grievance, but really relate that um, both um, laterally and also uh, vertically in, in time and, and, and to better uh, understand this. And, and then in terms of moving forward, in terms of this competition in, in the sciences, I, I, um, I wrote an essay in Wired uh, last month uh, about this in, in particular, that um, I, I think this is a concept that um, unfortunately, and I really say unfortunately, that it seems like Beijing and Washington have uh, basically accepted this is the, the framework of 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 of, um, of, of what the, the US China relations would be and and going forward and but that, that framework but then we are seeing saying that we are in the academy that we uh, are not government officials or anything that we don't need to conform to the narrative of the state if we actually examine that narrative and it really falls apart like competition for what <laughs> by what and by what metric and to what end? Like, uh, uh, what is that supposed to mean? And, and to, to accept this framework of a competition, it means that somehow it, it is to accept this 
this artificial boundary in the form of, of, of national political borders. Um, but if we actually take away the border, then we see the countries themselves, whether the US or China or any country, is not a monolith, and the interest within the country is not uniform. And, and actually, like if we Earlier, we talked about certain Olympians, uh, the, the global elite can live in a borderless world and their interests in a way are aligned. And then the people who are like a, a delivery driver in China or a delivery driver in the US may see their interests are aligned and, and the ways they're oppressed are also very similar in these global systems of capitalism. So if we reject these simplified false dichotomies and false binaries as uh, dictated by the state, then we actually gain a much more complex and much more truthful understanding of the world. Thank you. Um, I have another question too, or I'm gonna to try to combine this. Uh, the question is, uh, do you have thoughts on the connection between Chinese identity and Chinese American identity, especially considering that the language and cultural connections are more severed in Chinese Americans? And as a Chinese American, how do we adopt American culture? And maybe um, you want to talk about that. Mm. So I would, uh, I, I'm not evading the question, but I think this is not a question I'm not qualified to answer because um, I know that also like Asian American by itself, it's not predicated on, on citizenship because also because of the racist immigration citizenship laws in the US that and only until like the later half of the 20th century that most Asians in the US can actually gain citizenship. So, so this concept was developed um, regardless of, of, uh, of, of immigration immigration status and then so um in that sense but but i myself like i am i i think in this uh, in this context of this question i think it is asking about people who uh, do have a, a closer <laughs> legal relation to, to, to the United States and also probably did grow up in the US. And I came to the US as a young adult. And so so I think um I think what I would say here it it's um it's a good thing. It means that just because we look this way <laughs> doesn't mean our experiences are equivalent. Our experience can be very, very different. And, and our perceptions um, of, of both China and the US and our place in it and our identities can also be, be very different. And that is a good thing, that, mo that, that multitude is a good thing. And, and, and for how Chinese Americans would see themselves, this is a question for, for the Chinese American community. And I would be um, a, listen, a listener and a student in, in this context to also learn more and, and, and help inform my own understanding of my place in the world as well. Thank you. Um, then how about we discuss Chineseness from an ancestral sense? For example, um, this person's grandparents are from China, but immigrated to Singapore. My parents immigrated from Singapore to the US and there's a struggle between discovering themselves as Chinese or Singaporean or describing themselves as Chinese or Singaporean. Do you have a thought on that? Yeah. Uh... <laughs> So, so I think uh, I think I think this is what I'm really glad that uh, this question was raised because I know that we are we are speaking um, inevitably even as an academic like uh, my. Uh, my, my views of, of the world are, are limited by, by 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 the extent of my scholarship, and and they are uh, inevitably um, conditioned on my own experiences and perspectives. And of course, so we are we're speaking on this more uh, about U.S. And, and China, as in still China. And but there is uh, the Chinese diaspora in, in many different parts of the world, and especially in South and Southeast Asia. Um, that um, who's on um, who have um inherited a lot of Chinese traditions. And of course, this also relates to the earlier question about regional differences, because during the times of, of, of migration, like um, the, the a lot of the uh, uh, migration to South, uh, Chinese migration uh, to South and Southeast Asia were from uh, regions that uh, traditionally were seen on, on the peripheries of Chinese empires, um, far from, from the political center. Uh, and so, so there, and then also these are the regions that were um, first uh, um, were the first encounters with um, 
at times violent encounters with Western imperial powers. So these are all, are all contexts that build into what that particular Chinese-ness in that time in history and from that region was, and how that, of course, also moves uh, and, and shifts uh, through, gener uh, through time and through migration and through geographical and, 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 and generational changes. And, and I think um, and, and that, that is a type of Chinese-ness that is very different from from the Chinese-ness that would say be defined by Beijing today. And I think that is uh, that is also a, a good thing. There is a really lovely book. Oh, I think I actually do I have it next to me somewhere. Oh, Home is Not Here um, by this um, uh, Chinese scholar uh, Wang, uh, Wang Guangwu. So he was um, um, born to uh, Ch Chinese um, parents um, but uh, grew up in, in Indonesia and then um, and then uh, moved back to China for for school and then left again and and then so he was on um, so he, this is his memoir called home is not here so just about how on um, his perception of his Chineseness and his perception uh, and his father's perception of his Chineseness and how uh, the later after the founding of the People's Republic, what kind of Chinese-ness were, were allowed were all very, uh, very, very different things. And, and so it's always, it's a, it's a journey and it's a search. Thank you for sharing that book. Um, we do have a question later on if we get to it about your Wired article um, and other um, resources you might uh, suggest, lectures and writings. Um, we could talk a little bit about that perhaps just at the very end and we are winding up here. So. Um, the next question is, um, I've always been struggling with the term Chinese when it means so much different lived experiences, but I also have a narrow down, it also got narrowed down to a single story of being a Chinese national. My question is, how do you go about your daily communication with people to bring awareness of this nuanced term of Chinese? Um. <laughs> I, I think I think one thing that like of course we're <laughs> giving this talk and we're having this conversation today, um, but and of course and also I, I now uh, well I was trained as a physicist and now I, I work on um, work at the law school but um, but but in, 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 in China studies more, more broadly defined and and of um, so so it is also a subject of my my academic research um, but um, but my I, I, I don't live my daily life putting my Chinese-ness in other people's face, right? Like, <laughs> I, 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 live, I live my life like, like an ordinary person. And, and so, um, so I think, I think uh, I, maybe I misunderstood, uh, maybe I misunderstood the question. But I, I, I think on one hand, I, I, I understand my, my position in, in um, in American society, in the sense of, um, I say that since COVID-19 um, pandemic started and that with both like the geopolitical context and also on the racialized violence in the US, that this is the first time like I felt most acutely Chinese in my body that I, be, I grew a new awareness of, of this Chinese body I, I inhabit. And so that is something I am aware of, but I also uh, need to, to live and, and it's not, <laughs> It, it's not um it's not like I, I do my academic work and I write for for the public but in, in daily conversations I am not nearly presumptuous enough to think that it's my somehow my my uh, my, my obligation uh, to to be uh, <laughs> educating uh, others about what China or Chineseness means so so that's that <laughs> okay um, I think your your grace and your charm and, and uh, your um, your ability to get uh, to the meat of the matter um, is also something that um, they will take away and, and know that um, it's part of being Chinese. I hope. Uh, are are we do have a guest from Australia? Um, he's uh, suggesting that he's organizing a national roundtable uh, where the key discussions next week are on the distrust of and bias against Chinese internet and social media platforms, especially WeChat in Australian media and academic academia. And then our two questions are Chinese migrants from China, mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore share common Chinese culture. And if there are commonalities, what are those? Um, is there a need to align the Chinese culture with Australian values? 
um, is there a practical or incompatible difference between the two cultures? And I don't know how much you know about Australian culture, but go for it. Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, I've never perhaps been perhaps frame that from I, he did ask to frame it maybe from American culture if that would help. Uh, I've I've never been to to Australia and but but even if we frame it in in the sense of American culture, what is American culture? Especially like uh, what is American value? Like this is a phrase that I um, actually think it is um it is intellectually lazy and indeed morally and historically inconsistent because this is um. And this is a settler colonial state. This is a country that was built on, on genocide and slavery. That was the founding of this country. And so what is American values? If there's some other kind of values towards uh, humanity, equality, and justice, just say what that is. But giving that the name of a continent, which has become synonymous with the name of a country, which is also a, a side effect of American exceptionalism and imperialism, is really uh, <laughs> um, unnecessary. And, and it is a form of, of essentializing and um, the self as well, which is, of course, also comes hand in hand with exoticizing, uh, exoticizing the other. And so, um, so if we actually look back, uh, like I think, for example, if we look at the um, the quote that I mentioned in, in the talk from the 11th century, the Song era uh, philosopher, uh, Zhang Zai, that uh, Wang Ji uh, Xian likes to, <laughs> in Ukraine, like, likes to quote. Now, this is a, 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 a this is a, hu a humanist, a, a, a expan a expansive idea of philosophy of life that I can find a lot of resonances in, in um, with, with sayings in different cultures at different points in history through like Europe, Asia, and uh, and the, the Americas as well. And so, uh, and so, so I think um, um, this question coming from Australia, it's really it's not a question so much as in uh, different people who uh, it, different ethnic minority communities in, in Australia, including like of course. All, Australia has a, a, a long and a rich uh, history of, of, uh, of Chinese, uh, ethnic Chinese migration from different parts of Asia through its, um, through the long uh, uh, centuries. And um, it's really a question about what, not about what the Chinese community in Australia are. It's a very diverse community based on, as, as the uh, questioner also mentioned, based on their, 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 uh, their, their backgrounds and then their, their countries of origin. But it's really about what Australia sees itself is and whether or not uh, Australia as a, as a society, especially the dominant, the majority in Australia, um, the racial majority and the political uh, uh, powers see what their country and what their identity is. Thank you. Do you have any articles or books you'd like to share with others to let them learn a little bit more about these very fascinating topics? Well, I think since I'm, I'm speaking at, uh, at a university and I believe that everyone already um, um, had has has long uh, reading lists. I, I can um I, I don't know I can put in the chat window the the two essays I mentioned on um, that I wrote just because um, I did reference them in, in in the question and answer session. And other than that, um uh, well I did mention Wang Guangwu's book <laughs> as well, and um, which is a really uh, really lovely book and and is talking about a, a form of Chinese experience that I myself didn't know either. And so okay, so this is my Wired article that is uh, from last month about U.S. China scientific uh, competition and and the fallacies of that narrative, and um, and then I have a. And then I mentioned last fall, I have an article in uh, The Atlantic about academic freedom and how the concept of China and, and Chinese presence on US campuses are being perceived. And so, so that's that. Okay, thank you so very much. Um, I've enjoyed all of these articles myself and um, it, I loved your description about having the ground splitting between your feet. You are certainly straddling the U.S.-China relationship, you're building bridges, and we're very appreciative of that. Thank you so very much for being with us, Dr. Zhang. Oh, thank you so much, and I really enjoyed uh, the, the discussion and these really fantastic questions, and they gave me a lot to think about and learn from as well. Okay, great. Take care.